colleagues and co-participants wish you all a very good evening today is the third day of the faculty development program today's resource person professor madhu parhar professor indira gandhi national open university today's topic is assessing attainment of po pso and course outcomes professor parhar was the former director and professor of distance learning she is specialized in education with extensive experience in institutional design and development faculty development online education teachers education etc currently she is working currently she is employed with indira gandhi national open university center for online education at new delhi she also worked with commonwealth educational media center for asia simca coal vancouver at new delhi from june 2019 to may 2022 she worked with wawasan open university at malaysia from july 2007 to july 2018 now we will listen from Pro professor parhar ma'am it is over to you thank you dr sudarsh to honor that i am so proud with your as i graduated from university uh in march so uh, uh the point which you said that i am working with the center for online education i am not but yes just to uh, uh one or two lines that uh, to our colleagues who are attending this online program i was the director of stri that is staff training distance education institute of institute of distance education in uh, igno i was director of i was director of um indira gandhi uh, center for online education indira gandhi national open university uh i was the director of sanga which is open Madam, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Your voice is breaking, ma'am. Okay. Ah, uh, actually, but my the other internet was showing me that signal low. So that may be the reason. It is in it. So maybe it is just uh, clashing with that. Is it okay. clear now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now clear. Yeah. Once it will read my dongle also, so it will so. So there is internet issue in our area at the moment. Okay, let me just share my slides. I hope I will be able to share this. is it visible no ma'am still not it's coming no no ma'am yeah ma'am now it says okay. camp okay but uh, i cannot see any one of you i don't know why mm -hmm. 
but in Zoom, yes, I can see the participants, but I'm not able to see. So I'll just try again, stop sharing. Mm, share again. Ma'am, once you are PPT on. Yeah, now PPT on, ma'am. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Visible. But I have to put it from the beginning. Yeah. Now is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this yes, is already. Okay. Okay. So uh, we will start the session. So I was assigned by Doctor um, by the by by the organizers a session of uh, assessment of program outcomes, course outcomes, and the second one was, if I understood correctly in the mail, what it was written that how to handle the slow learners average learners and advanced learners or the teaching strategies for the diverse learners. So this was the two topics assigned to me. So first we will begin with the assessment of attainment of program objectives, course objectives and course outcomes. This was the title given. Now, I understand from your program schedule that yesterday you had a session on learning outcomes. Am I correct? It was taken by Dr. Papier. So, friends, you can please start uh, sending messages on the chat. You can try, write it down. We will see. Uh, the, uh, I respond to those chat messages simultaneously or at the end we take your questions but but keep writing it down please that will be making it the session more interactive and not a one-way communication and not a one instructivist system of learning so uh, Dr. Papaya did yeah, the learning outcomes yesterday with you all, but let's see now how these learning outcomes can be assessed. That is the crux of actually today's session. But I will have a little bit of uh, the course objectives or learning outcomes uh, description from yesterday's session and what I will be presenting. So, my friend, can you please your mind? Please? Friends, if you can please mute your mic so that the others are not disturbed. Thank you. So I just want to know from all of you that what did you learn yesterday? Can you unmute the mic and then speak one or two? Or you can write it down in the chat if you want to. What did you learn yesterday? Yesterday was a session. Your course, this training program started on the 11th. On 11th, also, there was a session on um, uh, attrib graduate attributes and how to write objectives and so on. So what did you actually learn yesterday? Any one of you, you can unmute your mic and you can speak, please. See, yesterday, yes, we Dr. have learned about... Dr. Palme, from where are you? From which institution you are? No, I am from uh, south, southern part of India, uh, coastal Karnataka, Mangalore. Which institution? I am from Srinivasa University, Mangalore. Oh, okay. It's a it's formal a university. university. It's a private university established by the Act of uh, 
ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಪ್ರೈವೇಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಗೈಡ್ಲೈನ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸಿಒಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ Okay, just give me one concrete thing. What is the course outcome? What do you understand yeah, the course? course outcome? Yeah, course outcome means what will be the students know after completing the course. After completing so the course, called, what will this? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that is called the course outcomes. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? What did you learn yesterday? we are more than uh, 40 participants here i need to have a response it cannot be a one way communication friends it's not it's we it we want to make it like a formal classroom here just the technology the only difference is that you have a technology in between see the course outcomes are not the problem specific outcome dr padmanabh dr padmanabh can i have someone else i know you has just spoken please can i have answer from someone else yeah ma'am hello yes yes yeah ma'am good evening this is bin padmato from ifai university tripura okay ma'am we uh, yesterday ma'am has discussed the mapping of co and pos the mapping of co and po did you do yeah. earlier that mapping of co and po yeah earlier also it was there but yesterday ma'am also discuss about the co po mapping okay okay last one anyone else next hello hello yeah uh, this is ma'am from west bengal kolkata uh, this is shahanwar okay. actually ma'am ma'am discuss uh-huh. previously uh, the different action verb on the basis of the uh, bloom's taxonomy uh, and related to co- okay. program outcome and course outcome okay 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 fine so uh, basically all of you you learned about the outcomes and if i understand about the bloom's taxonomy and if i go further you must have learned that how to write learning outcomes right so many of you you must have already done that how to write learning outcomes but still maybe in today's session maybe we will just go through a few of the more points or the same points or i will uh, share with you something uh, different or and then come to how to assess it okay the first and the foremost many a times you must have seen many of us ya rather all of us we say learning objectives we say learning outcomes so there is actually and all of you you must be asking you must have asked also yesterday that what is the difference between a learning objective and a learning outcome why should we write learning objectives or why should we write outcomes okay my answer will be that actually they are synonymous to each other but there is a little difference in what the learning objective when we write objectives and when we write the outcomes so objectives are basically what we aim to achieve and set a clear direction okay for example all of you you have come to this training program you have an aim let's say the aim was to get a certificate and which will which, that is the aim to get a certificate and that clear direction was you approached nsou you paid 500 rupees you were given a schedule and here you are and that was your object right 
Now, what is outcome? Outcome is whether how well the aims have been met. So after doing this program for five days, seven days, then what were what you learned? What was the learning outcome? Okay. So this is a difference between objectives and outcomes. So the learning outcomes these all over, whether in school education or in higher education, we use this term learning outcomes. UGC is using this learning outcomes. They are saying use this term learning outcomes. NCRT in their books, they are using that is in school education. They are saying that we should have learning outcomes. Then what are what is the formal definition if we say and what of learning outcomes? So these are the descriptions. If you will see it on your screen, these are the descriptions of the specific knowledge, skills that the learner will get from learning activities or even from a training session like this training session or a program or a course or either from a seminar. So outcome is basically after this session or after this training program, you will be able to write down learning outcomes based on Bloom's taxonomy. So that is the outcome of this training program. And your learning objective was that you have to undergo this training program. Both the things are correct, but there is a minor difference. But we use both these terms interchangeably. Now, why these learning objectives or writing learning outcomes, they are very important. I'm sure again yesterday you must have learned about it, but still maybe we will just go through it so that we do well what we want to, uh, the, the subject was. So some of the reasons why these writing, these learning objectives are important, you can select your content. Now, this training program, we have our colleagues from the formal system. We have our colleagues from the distance education system or well, let's say open universities or directorate of distance education. Now, the difference between now the participants here is that from open universities, they develop learning material. In formal system, Basically, the teachers, they are not developing the learning material. But both are selecting the content. In formal system, a teacher is selecting the content to transact in the classroom. When a teacher, he or she is teaching in the classroom, they are selecting the content. In open and distance education system, because you are writing the material there, you are producing a video, you are going into an online program, you are selecting the content. And that's why the learning objective to write down your learning outcomes is very important because you select the content. Second important reason for writing of the learning objective is you develop a, your learning or instructional study based on your learning object. Okay, what is instructional strategy? Instructional strategies, whether you use a lecture method or a demonstration or a practical or cooperative learning or a project work and so on and so, or a video and so on and so forth. So based on what is your learning outcome, you develop your instructional strategy. What we have done, in our education system or in our professional academic lives, till day, what we were doing is, we were not writing learning outcomes. We were never aware of learning outcomes. On our own, we were just developing our strategy, how to impart instruction in the classroom. If you remember, I'm not talking about this group only, but our education system as a whole, we were just using few instructional strategies. But once you start writing your learning outcomes, 
you develop for each learning outcome, you develop a different instructional strategy. Third important, why do you write down the learning outcomes of your objective is you develop and you select your instructional material. It's very important, especially when we talk about open and distance education, your instructional materials are different. You can have an audio, you can have a video and so on and so forth. Even in formal system, you have different materials where the students are provided. The learning outcomes are depend upon or your instructional material depend upon your learn instructional uh, on the on selecting the instructional material. Last important point, which is the discussion point today, is you construct test for assessment and evaluate student learning outcomes. I'm sure yesterday, when Dr. Papia must have talked about how to write learning outcomes, one of the important points, why do we write learning outcomes is because when we frame learning outcomes, Based on those learning outcomes, you write your assessment. So learning outcomes are basically, when we write, it should be measurable. We will be just doing what we talk about. Remember this point was dealt yesterday? Please say yes or no. Unmute yourself and say yes or no so that I know you yes, are with me. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes. Okay. So it was that you construct your test once you have written your learning outcomes. You construct your test based on the student learning outcome. Now, yesterday, Papia must have talked about Bloom's taxonomy, right? So Bloom's taxonomy is one of the taxonomies. I know this is used by each and every teacher, all organizations, not only in India, but world over. Because this is a very, very popular taxonomy, Bloom's taxonomy. Based on that, we write our learning outcomes. But there are several other taxonomies which can be applied, which can be used to construct your learning outcomes. I know we don't use that, we the teachers, we don't use that, but these are again very important as educators, as teacher educators, distance education educators, or any other subject educators, you should know that there are more taxonomies based on which we can write down our learning outcomes. So just two, I have mentioned it and which you can see it on the screen. One is Gaine's nine events of instruction. I'm sure my colleagues who are from the education background, they know. And another is the solo taxonomy, which, which it, why, why it is, it says, that the, the approach here by solo taxonomy, it deals with the different levels of students' understanding. The purpose of this workshop is not getting into the details of the different taxonomies, but I just thought I'll make you aware of two more taxonomies. One is Gaine's Nine Events of Instruction and another is solo taxonomy. Go read it out whenever you find time, because you will learn more about how to write learning taxonomy other than based on the Bloom's taxonomy. I repeat again, all of us, we use Bloom's taxonomy. Now, how to write the learning objectives using Bloom's taxonomy? Today, you must have done. The old taxonomy, I'll skip this part. The old taxonomy by Bloom was at six levels of learning. Knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. I did not get into the detail. That's what it is. The human beings learn at this basic six levels. Our learning is at six levels. 
the lowest level is knowledge and the highest level is evaluation. But this was an old taxonomy. The revised taxonomy blooms to students very recently. Very recently means almost 20 years back. Revised this technology and they created a new taxonomy, which if you'll see it on your screen, it talks about the creating part. Create. Once again, I request you please switch mute your mics, please, and then you talk with the uh, family. So create is the highest level of learning. That's what the the Bloom's two students present for thought. They, they propose that that learning is at the highest level read. And then again, all of you know, Papi Amas have done that Bloom's taxonomy is divided into three aspects cognitive, affective, and the psychomotor level. Okay. So uh, we are just talking these days, we only talk about cognitive. No one talks about affective and the psychomotor. The learning outcomes also, we are not writing based on the affective or the psychomotor. Agree or you don't agree. You can write it down on the chat and then later on we can discuss about it. That we the teachers, we are not writing our learning outcomes at the effective or at psychomotor level. Whereas many of the disciplines, many of the subjects, they talk about the effective part of it and the psychomotor part, like poetry, English literature. It is all your effective domain of learning, right? But we, we the teachers, we don't do. And the second important point is we the teachers, when we don't even the cognitive just cater to our learning outcome at these three levels. And the higher of the cognition, which all of you, you must be knowing a common terminology, lots and hots, which is called lower order cognition and higher order cognition. We only deal with the lower order cognition because we find it easy. And again, I repeat, it is not only the group of teachers who are attending this program, but lots of teachers across all levels, school, school education or higher education, across institutions, we are just writing learning outcomes at this level. But we need to write our learning outcomes at higher level. But this is also important, but we need learning outcomes at this level also. Now, how do you create learning objects? We go through it. Yes, it presentation. Learning outcomes should be always learner centered. It should not be teacher centered. Or you know, I'll not get into the detail part of it. You all know. I'll skip this. So, but do you write it down? The learning outcomes. That you say at the end of the course or at the end of the program, should students should be able to. Like after reading this lesson, you should be able to. After watching this video, you should be able to. Like after attending this program, you should be able to write learning outcomes based on who's on. So that's what, how do you write down the beginning of it? So important part is learner center, not teacher center. Those who have done BA, those who those who are in this training program, we write down our lesson plans. I think earlier days we always used to write down that what the teacher will be doing in the classroom. But the whole pedagogy has changed. We are concentrating, we are emphasizing on what learners will be doing. Okay, so that's why we say the students or you watching this video, attending this training program, you will be able to do it. Next important point, I'll skip this. That's uh, your learning of, of learning outcomes. 
by using some observable action verbs. Okay, so observable action verbs. Friends, I think there was some problem with the internet, so I I can begin from the present start. Is it visible now? There is an issue yeah, with the internet. Now, now, now visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, so you all know. Maybe I'll run through it quickly. The, so, action verbs result in overt behavior. There are two kinds of behaviors: overt behavior and covert behavior. Overt behavior is when you, like, in a simple terms, when you are nodding your head. So, I know you are understanding. This is something overt behavior. So, I know you are. And covert behavior is the learning inside what's happening in the cognitive part of it. Okay. So, maybe I'll say. Don't use when you are writing down your learning outcomes. Don't use these terms like understand, grasp, learn, appreciate, and so on. These are not action words. Like if I say, do that, use that uh, term, understand. That after in this unit, you will be, the students will be able to understand what is Bloom's taxonomy. Understand means you cannot measure. That's the point it is. Action verb, when we use the action verb based on the Bloom's taxonomy, is measuring. Understand means this much understanding, this much understanding, this much understanding. From learner to learner, the understanding will vary. But we want to measure the that learning, and so we don't use these uh, terms. These are should be this is important point that learning objectives should be measurable should go the selection of assessment and then they cannot be vague very very important point is your learning outcomes should be measurable so your assessment should be made in such a way that they are measuring the learning outcome and this is the main point which we lack in our education system. Now, another important point when you write down the learning outcome is there should not be too many or too few learning outcomes. Four to six is the ideal number. But again, on what program, what course, what is for you are writing your learning outcomes? For which class you are writing your learning outcome? For which training program you are writing your learning outcomes? So, so the learning outcomes is when you write it down, you have yesterday you did, day before you did. So you write learning outcomes. UGC has said that you write your program outcomes. You write your less course outcomes, then you write your lesson outcomes. Okay? I don't know how many teachers in the formal system they are doing it, but I know in open and distance education system, the open universities, they are writing program outcomes, they are writing course outcomes, and they are writing the lesson outcomes. If you are doing the formal system teachers, you can always just write it down in the chat. That it will... Now, what is a program? Again, you know, a program can be a BSc in chemistry, a BSc in zoology, a BA in commerce, a BA in economics, 
or BTEC in computer science, BTEC in electrical engineering, and so on and so forth. So program refers to the entire scheme of study. Okay. And course is what you is course is is the individual courses of study that make up the scheme of study for a program. So if you see this picture on the screen, a just an illustration. Program is BA economics. Under BA economics, you can have course one, course two, course three, course four. And Can't hear anything, ma'am. Let's go. Go. Hello, can't hear anything. Please Hello. wait. Hello. I think it's a technical uh, glitch. Technical. Okay, okay ma'am. Uh, please be patient. Ma'am will join again. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. I'm sorry, apologies for this. Uh, again, there was, there was an internet Yeah, issue. yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Something it happened like that. It's a technical error. So the uh, program, and you know all about the program and the course. Uh, so now what UGC has to say uh, about uh, this program outcomes and the course outcomes, maybe I'll quickly go through it. The UGC, what you document, what it is, I have taken it from the website. The source is given on the slides. You will be able to get the slides. I will send it across. So program learning outcomes, as per the UGC document, it says, the outcomes which are described in qualification descriptors and are attained by students through learning acquired on completion of a program. So there is nothing to, uh, we all understand it. So second point, point what the UGC says, program learning outcomes, they should be aligned with re relevant qualification descriptors. Okay. So what is the qualification and what it should be? a program should be that should be the thing so these are the things what the ugc has described now again what are the course learning outcomes so course learning outcomes as given by the ugc is something which should be written which should be specific to the learning for a given course so if a course is on uh, let's say, um, write research methods, it should be on the various research methods. If the course is on how to write down the statistical techniques, what are the various statistical techniques, the course is on that, your learning outcomes should be based on that. And you see, if you see on the slide, UGC has added one more point, 
which they are talking about in the national education policy also, that it is study related to the discipline or it should be multidisciplinary area. So that's what the, the UGC has talked about when they're talking about the course learning outcomes. Now, again, the course learning outcomes should be specific to a course. That's what, again, UGC says. So at the course level, each course have, each course have links to some, but not all graduate attributes. Graduate attributes, day before you have already done, we will not get into the detail of the graduate attributes. Now, program outcome, the difference between a program outcome and a course outcome. Program outcome is what the graduate students of a specific degree program should be able to do. And course outcome is, it is the knowledge and skills at the end of the course. It is very clear what are the program outcomes and what are the course outcomes. So if you are writing, we will take an example and then we will see what are the program outcomes and what are the course outcomes. Now the question arises, are institutions measuring learning outcomes? Can anyone unmute myself and ask this question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the institutions are measuring through different assessment program. How? Uh, uh, exam. Uh, like end semester examination, presentation, project based work. Very good. It's very good. That's what is you call it as formative assessment, summative assessment. Yes. This is very good. Any anyone else? May I, ma'am? Yes. Uh, Ma'am, this is Kostak Chakravarti. Uh -huh. I think to sum up the entire thing, I think the, the institution primarily focus on two types of assessment. One is, uh -huh. the, one is the cognitive assessment, which include a lot of project work, research-based uh, oriented assessments. And one is uh -huh. the practical one that includes the hand-on skill-based uh, activities and work. Okay. My question, basically, if you'll see it on screens, my question is, are institutions measuring learning outcomes? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Through the assessment, examination. No, fine. I understand uh, through assessment. That is very clear than what all of you, you have been saying. I have also said it is either a formative assessment, which all of you, you do in a classroom or after yeah. uh, weekly examinations. And if we talk about school level or uh, monthly examination or half yearly examination, semester examination or at the end of the year. So that I understand that is called a summative evaluation. And formative, what we have yeah, talked yeah. about. But do we, the teachers, we design our assessment based on learning outcome? No, ma'am. Okay. This is what I wanted to uh, share with you. Basically, if you will see, what we, when we assess our students... When we assess our students based on, a, let's say, annual examination, okay? What we do, what we all teachers, what we do, we take out the papers of the last five years and we just write down the questions and prepare our question paper. Again, I repeat this is not that you all I'm talking about. It is general education system, what we do it. But UGC is talking about now, or the education, the, the, the new pedagogy, the, the pedagogy of the assessment, it talks about that whatever learning outcomes we are defining at the beginning of the program or the course, we should assess that learning outcome. That's the point. And honestly, you said 
that we are not measuring the learning outcomes. We just measure something. And at several times, what we do, we measure when we make our question papers. It is not out of the whole course. We just take few few units and uh, we say do um, uh, out of 10 questions, do five. Students also know that I can read five lessons out of 10 lessons. If there are 10 lessons in a course, 10 topics in a course, whatever you call it. If I do five, learn, just read five, I will get good marks. So I don't have to read all the 10. So that is what it is. Okay. So uh, basically measuring learning outcomes, what it, it can do is it can inform the institution about the educational environment. So when you, me when you measure your learning outcomes, how it's going to help the organization. It is going to help the organization that what is the educational environment. These days, we are talking about the learning environment, the educational environment. We are not talking about just completing the course or the syllabus. We are talking in which environment, educational environment, or the institutional environment, if it is good, then only one can achieve the learning outcome. Second important point it talks about that why do you measure learning outcomes? They are measured at various points during your educational experience that all of you, you know. Okay, now the functions of what the functions of a program outcome. Again, you must have done yesterday. It provides direction, it conveys instructional intent, and it provides the basis for assessment. If you write, how do you write the effective program outcomes, which should be relevant to discipline? It should be clear and measurable. Every time we are talking about measurable assessment, that the learning outcomes should be measurable, should be, we should assess them. And it should be flexible to diverse teaching methods. Now, some one just example to make uh, you clear about a learning outcome. That uh, is example, like a clear learning outcome will be identify and summarize the Erickson stages of development. An unclear learning outcome is that the students will understand Erickson's developmental stages. This is an example I have given because majority of the time, if you will see the learning outcomes in books or when we prepare our uh, lesson plans, learning designs, we write in this way. Students will understand and we will not say that we'll identify or summarize, but we will say understand. So that's just an example given. Now, this is an example of a course program of Master of Computer Application. So what will be your program outcomes? And there will be several courses in this MCA program. So one of the courses I have taken is Java programming. And what will be the course outcome? So I will not get into the detail of it. Maybe just one program outcome, uh, I will read it out. This is like program outcome is written that identify, formulate research literature and solve complex computing problems, reaching substantiated conclusions. So these are the program outcomes. Course outcome, if you will see clearly, it mentions define. Define, learn, inheritance, apply. Though learn should not be here because learn again is not an action verb. How much you have learned, it is not measurable. Define, define is measurable. Apply, apply is measurable. So these are things, so that's what it all actually depends upon. So this is just an example I had given. Now, many a times we talk about evaluation. I will not get into the detail of it, but if you want to evaluate or assess your program, so how there are various steps. What are the steps? First and foremost, 
one should articulate your specific relevant and specific learning outcomes. You should map your courses. Yesterday, you must have uh, read about the courses. I'll skip this slide, but I'll come to the course learning outcome again. The course learning outcomes, these are the two to six statements about what the teachers, they expect students to be able to do at the end of the course. Types of the course learning outcomes, these are cognitive outcomes, behavioral outcomes, effective outcomes. This all of you again know. Now, assessment methods. Again, what the UGT has talked about when they are talking about program outcomes, course outcomes, the UGC has talked that there are several variety of assessment methods which are for a given discipline. For physics, it will be a different assessment method which will vary, which will not, cannot be same for a discipline or a, or a program or a subject for history. You all know about it. So, assessment method for economics will be entirely different from an assessment method of a biochemistry. So, that's very, very important part of it. And that's what the UGC has talked about. Variety will be accorded to formative assessment. That's what UGC talked about. Why they have said formative assessment, can anyone say? Can anyone write it down in the chat? Or you can unmute yourself. Ma'am, formative assessment, yeah. it is said formative assessment because this is the developmental phase. So uh, when we are going for the course outcomes, we um, ask such kind of questions. We assess, try to assess the uh, students on such type of questions so that their base is developed. So that's why it is known as formative. Okay, fine. Fine. Anyone else? Anyone else? Formative evaluation is a more comprehensive one. Okay. It's a continuous. Continuous and comprehensive. Okay. See, formative assessment is very important because the teacher here will be able to know whether the students are with the content or they are learning or not. For example, I don't assess them each and every day. I assess students only at the end of the year or after six months. Students, they don't know whether they have learned. Teachers, they don't know whether students have learned. Teachers, they don't know which unit, which lesson, which concept the students have learned, where they are lagging behind, what part teacher has to improve upon, so on and so forth. So that's what the importance of formative assessment is all about. Okay? I'm sure all of you, if the, the open and distance education teachers, those who are attending this program, when they write down their units, they write down in between self-check questions. Even you as teachers in a formal system, when you take a class, after let's say 15 minutes or 20 minutes, you ask a question in the class so that you know whether the students, they have learned whatever concept you have talked about. Assessment, you can also do it through in the formal classroom through gestures. 
like if students are nodding if students are dry if students they are not listening you know that students they are not interested or their students they are not understanding each teacher can have their own interpretation so that's why ugc says priority should be given to form formative assessment now second important point what ugc says there are several tools so you ugc has talked about that there should to a progress towards achievement or learning as outcomes will be assessed using the following time constrained examinations which is basically what you talk about many of these exams which you have you have to do it one hour two hours all your life insurance banking and all those exams are time constrained that's what you talk about that in one hour you know that you have to do 100 questions closed book and open book test which has not become very popular in indian education system at the moment but they have started ugc has started talking about but they have talked about that you need to have the practical assignment laboratory reports they have to have individual project reports you have to have oral presentations seminar presentation viva voices computerized adaptive testing peer and self assessment etc which are important so if you will see again go read this document the link is given on this slide which you will be getting the slides you will be getting so go read this whole document what they are talking about how to assess program outcomes and how to assess the learning outcomes now this last two three slides when we talk about the assessment part of it on one hand we have various assessment tools and the important point is when you when you assess learning outcome you assess learn outcomes at all these levels because you are writing learning outcomes at all these levels that is by using this bloom's taxonomy am i clear Yes, ma'am. So I hope I am able to make clear. This is important. So when we when we are assessing anything, learning outcome assessment, and what are we talking about that uh, it should be measurable. So each level should be measured. Each level should be assessed. Now. on one side you write down the level and on the other side to assess that level you have various tools assessment tools so like if you want to assess the remembering outcome that is the lowest level of cognitive learning you can use some objective type questions fill in the blanks matching multiple choice questions and so on suppose you want to do a higher order like analyze at level if you have seen your learning outcome at analysis level so what you give you are assessing your students based on your case studies your labs your debates you are making your concept maps and so on and so forth. okay creating assess the high level create for activities such as your research projects all your research projects or let's say in a simpler language what your research phd thesis is or your mphil dissertation is or your a masters dissertation is you are creating you are creating new knowledge so the assessment is the research project if you give them that's called the creative part your business plan the management courses your if you ask your students to write down a business plan each student will create a different plan that your learning outcome so let's say you are uh, you are writing a learning outcome that create a business plan for developing a good website okay create after 
learning web designing if that is the course title so the learning outcome will be create a good website design <coughs> so you are creating it and you are assessing then once the student will create a business plan for that that's what the assessment is all about so the point which I was emphasizing is, was you should, you need to align your assessment with the learning objective, which we, the teachers, we are not doing it. Okay. Now, last point, which I just want to emphasize is, this is just a blueprint, which I don't know how many teachers are doing it. When we are doing an assessment. So we write down the we make a blueprint and then we prepare our form of assessment or let's start with in summative assessment. So on one side you this blueprint you make your objectives, you write your knowledge, your comprehension, your expression, app, appreciation, etc. So under knowledge, under comprehension, understanding that is application, skills, etc. You write down your Type of question, essay type, short answer, very short answer, or this. Right. So you write down each and every unit. So, like in your course, in your course, there are seven units. So, when you make a blueprint, you are writing all those units here. Okay. Once you write down the, all your units, from each unit, then you frame a question. That's very, very important part. Whether from first unit you frame essay type or you frame short answer, it all depends upon the teacher and it all depends upon the content with. Okay? So, that's what you are saying when we talk about assessment measurable. You are talking about all the units, you are talking of all the levels, you are talking about all the tools. Various tools. That is what basically when we talk about, talk about the assessment of learning objectives or course objectives, this is the important point that you make a blueprint and based on your blueprint, then you start doing an assessment. That is very, very important. So, this is a two-way process. Your learning outcomes should be how it should be measurable. That is, you should assess. When you make your assessment, your assessment should be based on what your learning outcomes should be. Okay? So it is a two-way process. Teachers have to write basically what tools they have to use. There are several tools I'm not going to deal because all of you, you are teachers since last many years. You know various types of tools. These days, online tools have also come. I'm not talking about the online learning or the online tools, but there are various tools. And that's what the, the when we make the blueprint, there you can short objective type under objective time, multiple choice, true, false, and so on and so Those tools actually all of you, you know. But the main point is that teachers, they have to decide which tools have to do, what learning outcome, and so on and so forth. So this was basically a very brief on, um, on how you assess or learning outcomes, whether it is program outcomes or these are course outcomes. Now your questions. Your questions for five minutes and then we will start our another session. Any questions?
Friends, any questions? Uh, no, ma'am. No, no questions? Ma'am, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in the last class, yesterday's class, uh, we learned about uh, direct assessment tools and indirect assessment tools. Uh, okay. in, the, in, the, in the indirect assessment tools, uh, we come to know about the survey, that is feedback okay. survey, students feedback, alumni feedback. So I'd just like to know how this survey will help in the assessment, this indirect method assessment, the survey. This uh, so student feedback, alumni feedback, teachers feedback, uh, how this can help us as a tool. Okay, when we talk about the feedback, so you must be knowing that these days, uh, organizations, especially in the private institutions, they take a feedback from the students that how the teachers did in the class. Okay, that is one that you can take. A, is a, that's an example of a feedback. Then you take the, or the management, they take a feedback from the teachers also that how the students did it. In open and distance learning, I don't know whether you belong to Chandra, you belong to open and distance education or a formal system. In open and distance education system, when we give the learning material to the students, we have a page where we, give, we ask students that what was the concepts which were difficult, what were the concepts which were easy, whether the, the language was easy, whether the language was difficult, whether the assessment questions were effective, whether they were not effective. So that's what the whole process is. So those things you are asking from the feedback, this feedback will help the teacher, you, for improving for your next class. Okay? For your next session. Like suppose yes. today you give me a feedback that I was very fast in my communication. So what as a teacher I should do it that in the next session or in the next class, I should speak slowly. That's the feedback suppose you all give me today. Okay. Now, second feedback if you give me that your technology was, this was not proper. Your internet was not working. This is important. So for next time, I need to find it out. I need to improve upon my service provider. I have to change or I have to see. Right? Suppose my slides were not proper. The words were not visible. So if you all give me a feedback, honest feedback, that the the letters on your slides were not visible to us. So as a teacher, what I should do in the next class, that I should change my, I should make effective PowerPoint presentations. So there are various things. You develop a criteria. So you, you, you develop a feedback form so that, and which should include everything. Suppose I was not, my voice was not well modulated. That is also an important criteria. So once you give me a feedback, I will try to improve upon the next class. And that's what the whole feedback is all about. Surveys, what we talk about, you said indirect assessment. Surveys are basically, if you know, are done on a larger scale. Right? Feedback, you can do it on let's say today's session where there are less participants. If you want to do a survey that how social media is effective in imparting education. Okay, that's a survey. You can have thousand uh, uh, participants or thousand people across thousand teachers, thousand students or whatever it is. And you are asking that Facebook, whether the Facebook is relevant for education or not. So students, the, the, the survey participants, 
those from where you are taking the survey, whether you are doing an online survey or you are going to a market or you are going to a classroom from wherever you are doing it, that will give you of a, a information that Facebook is ineffective for imparting education or Facebook is effective for imparting education or Facebook is better than Instagram or Facebook is better than Twitter or Twitter is better than Instagram and so on and so forth. That's what the assessment is all about. I hope I'm able to make it clear. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, uh, you want, uh, um, Dr. Sudarshan, you want to give a break of two, three minutes and then come back or I can begin with the next one? Uh, ma'am, uh, as you wish, ma'am. Me, what everyone wants. Then again, because I'm talking about what you have been doing in the last two classes, I'll do that. If you want, if all of you, you want just a break for two, three minutes, I can do that. Dr. Sudarshan, what have been you doing yesterday or uh, usually uh, we uh, don't have any break man. okay you continue so okay let yes, me just um I have Okay, friends, welcome uh, for this, the, the next session, um, which is actually was on strategies for slow average and advanced learners. I was just wondering what we are talking about. We are talking about learners in schools or we are talking about learners in higher education. You have to tell me now. Ma'am, higher education will be helpful. Okay, higher education will be helpful. So my next question is to all of you, that students who are coming to all of you, aren't they coming from the school level? Yes. So what are you doing? You think I'm just talking about we, the teachers in higher education. So what, 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 what can we do? Uh, we help them and 
we help them understand the basic difference between school and uh, college that is higher education uh the kind like uh, they don't have prescribed textbook they have to frequent the libraries they have to listen to the lectures so that's basically we initially do anyone else anyone else or maybe i'll reframe my question a student let's say for example he or she is a slow learner in a school so can help him or her very good if the school has not helped or the student is still a slow learner you are in higher education we have the student okay then how you are going to help so whose responsibility is first whose responsibility ma'am first uh... Yes, yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, in, in my college, in my college, there is a student who is a slow learner. So oh. how we did, how I did with him, like how I dealt with him is that first, uh, the identification part was important. So uh, it took me some time to identify that, yes, this child, this student is a slow learner. I am from a B.A. college, so it's a professional course. So uh, I had to understand that, that yes, this uh, boy is a slow learner. And after that, we uh, like whenever we used to do any class, any lecture, any class, uh, we used to give the materials beforehand so that they can go through the materials so we can discuss the things. So after every class, I used to ask that if the class is understood and he was given always a chance or scope to clarify anything even outside the classroom. So that was something that we all do, did. I also did the same okay. thing that when I used to ask anything. Yes. Okay, fine. So basically you identified because you are from the education background. If suppose I ask any teacher who is from political science or let's say history or economics, do they identify and, uh, and uh, whether the students have been the slow learners have been given a treatment at school. That's very, very important. Because if I'm a slow learner from the very beginning, in the class 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 12th, my learning will be, if I'm not given, given different strategies, my learning will be the same in higher education. If I... If, if a teacher like you identifies, very good. If in a classroom of 40 students, I know in higher education, you have 30, 35. I don't know what is the minimum, 30, 35. Like in this session, we have 60. Teachers, they what they do is, they try to, they want to only finish the syllabus. Teachers, they don't go into identification of a slow learner or an average learner or an advanced learner. Do all of you, you agree to me on this statement or not? Yes, ma'am. All of you, yeah. only few of you. you are... Yeah, right? yes, ma'am. Yeah. See, in the classroom, let's see, uh, let's imagine in higher education, even that is also True for school education also. In school education, higher education, we have minimum 30 students in a class. If I'm an effective teacher, I will identify who are slow learners, or average learners, who are advanced learners. Okay? Based on that, I will change my strategies, instructional strategies, my method of teaching, my media, what I use it, my assessment, what I do is, but we teachers, we don't do it at all. Why? I think one just give reason is you all can have many more reasons. One reason is I'm always busy. I just want to finish my syllabus, my course, so that I my uh, the, the students, they don't say that the course is not finished. At the end of the year, I have to take an assessment or even after semester, after end of semester, I have to take an assessment. So I... 
majority of the teachers they don't identify the the various categories of learners in their class so all of you agree that we won't do it some of the teachers who are doing it very good but basically at large don't do that now there are various types of learners there is a lot of literature that the learners who are with us the there are various learning styles basically there are types of learners their learning styles is different there 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 are diverse needs there is a diversity all of you you know that so i thought maybe i'll pick up few points and then we can talk discuss about it so according to the emings model there are four types of learners okay i am sure all of you you know about that there are we categorize it fleming has categorized as visual learners auditory learners reading and writing and kinesthetic learners heard about this this model or this part or no did anyone uh, heard about this that we categorize or we 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 categorize or differentiate or we write down the types of learners into visual auditory reading and kinesthetic yeah it is work model work model of learning yeah. it uh, is work model of learning so yes. if you know if we divide the types of learners like visual learners visual learners are when they observe you must have seen many of you you yourself or students or your own children the you must have completely when they observe certain things when they are watching a book when they are watching any slides or images they learn better so the category of learners types of learners is that some when they listen or they are called auditory learners when they listen to the lecture when they listen any audio these days you have those podcasts or all your books are on to the podcast many of the students many of you you must be listening to those novels or books or poems or songs even songs also so those are called auditory learners i always uh, 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 think like give an example also that when i listen to the songs on the radio i literally remember majority of the songs and this must be true for i mean majority of all of us right that how do we learn how do we remember those songs we are auditory now the another type of learners are reading and writing when they when they read and they write they take notes which is mostly in a classroom reading and writing right and the last type of learners is the kinesthetic learners when they are doing something practical and then they learn so all your practical classes like in chemistry biology or biochemistry those are kinesthetic learners and a very simple example which i always love to give is that the cooking part of it <clears throat> what we do in the kitchen that we are practically making a dish and we are learning so that's what the kinesthetic learners are all about so the there are various types of learners but most of the students most of the people are combination of these four styles it's not that i say i am only an auditory like at the moment what you are doing it you are looking you are visually looking at the slides you are listening to me maybe some of you you are taking notes taking some points writing it down you are reading the slides and so on and so forth so basically a majority of the people they are a combination of these four styles then again another classification uh, is when we talk about the 21st century learners heard about this 21st century learners what are their attributes what are their um, qualities what are their characteristics 
yeah it is a first thing is bring your own device void technique no no that is a different that is a 24th century technique i talk about but children yeah, those yeah, who are yeah. born and many of you must be from that those who are born after 2000 we call 21st century learners because we are in the 21st century am i making it clear yeah yes ma'am yes ma'am I got so, the idea. Then there are there is a lot of literature now that and education. It is not only literature. People they are talking about that how to teach these twenty first century learners. I am sure many of you you are twenty first century learners. I am not. I am a still in a twentieth century, born in twentieth century, and is still a twentieth century learner. Right? Your students are, many of them, they are 21st century learners. We are into the third decade of the 21st century. So, there is a lot of literature that what are the attributes of these 21st century learners? I will quickly run through it. That they are very independent. They, they have a strong content knowledge. They have, they want evidences. They use technology and digital media very strategically. All of you, you know, the students of 21st century or learners of 21st century or the students of our present classes, they, how technology savvy they are. At least I can, I can wow for myself. I know, I don't know many things on the technology, but Students these days, they are children, they are born with technology these days. They are much better than how to use various devices, how to use various software. They know much more on how to get into the chat, chat GPT or Copilot or Gemini and so on and so forth. The characteristics of 21st century learners are entirely different. There is a lot of classrooms have become different. 21st century teachers, they have become different. But 21st century learning environment has become different. But what we do, we as teachers, we still treat our students as the 20th century, not only different. Hello, there is any problem? Hello, ma'am. PPT is not sharing, no voice. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm really sorry about this. My technology, my internet is not okay, okay, behaving, behaving today. So oh, my okay. apologies. <clears throat> So, okay, so when we talk about characteristics of 21st century, go read. There is a lot of literature on this, uh, but be the teachers or our education system. I should not talk about teachers are actually a part of education system. Our education system is still we are living in the 20th century. Okay, so there are characteristics of 21st century. Now, Another important point, what it should we should see, we have diverse learners. In the first slide, I said slow learners, average learners, advanced learners. Then I talked about 21st century learners. So we have actually in our classrooms diverse learners. And all of you know about that. We are not getting to detail, but maybe some points we will talk about that what are characteristics of these diverse learners. They are diverse in their academic ability. They are diverse in their physical abilities, language-wise, gender, 
ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic factors, and their personal experience, and so on. All of them would know. So what we were talking about that there are diverse because we have in our classrooms various diverse learners and there are the characteristics of these learners are entirely different. Now, based on the mode of learning, because here we have in this session teachers from formal system, we have teachers from the distance and the online education system. So in a formal system, when we talk about diverse learners, actually in a class, of let's say sixth grade, if we talk about school, if we talk about higher education, in BA economics, we have a classroom where the age is same. Agreed, all of you? But their learning ability is different. Agreed? You can write it on the chat or say, just unmute yourself and say yes or no, please. In you, if you agree, in a formal system like yes. in a BA class, you will have students of 19 years old. Okay, so it is the same age group in a formal system, but their learning ability is different. But when we talk about distance and online education, in our education, we have the age group different. We have a 18 year old student to a 90, 90, 90, 90 year old student also. Right? But again, their learning abilities are also different. So when we talk about base, you can think about other things also. But the main point which we talk about is in a formal system, they are from the same age group. But the spread. But when we talk about distance education, we have the age group different, but learning abilities are also different. Because when we talk about that, what strategies, as a teacher, what strategies you have to formulate depend upon your learning abilities. Now, if we talk about slow learners, again, uh, I don't know. Uh, my, my point was when we started that you are getting students from this the school level who are slow learners. How much <coughs> the teachers, they have been able to push up these slow learners to a certain level. We don't know in higher education. We never test that. But we, the teachers in higher education, maybe some of us, we identify them and we can give them a different strategies. But let's see and we can run through these slides. That slow learner is actually, it's a term that is sometimes used for low ability students and IQ between 20 and 85. I'll not get into the various IQ uh, classifications or the value. I will not get into those things. But basically, a slow learners, they are defined, they are termed, the low ability students with an IQ between 20 and 85. What are the basic characteristics of slow learners? I don't know whether in higher education will this be useful because it's all talks. No audible, ma'am. No audible, ma'am. Uh, I can't hear anything. Technical issues. Yes, I will start from okay. here. Now, again, again. Okay, <laughs> okay. so uh, the, when we talk about slow learners, um, I don't know in higher education whether you will be able to now in, in your classrooms, you can be able to find out or what are the characteristics. They are immature for their age. 
So that is one thing. Um, prefer playing with children who are younger than them. So this is actually, we are talking about slow learners at a school level. Uh, you can identify slow learners with this point that they cannot retain what they learn. That is what how slow learners you can identify or your characteristics. They have short attention spans. Again, it, it's not necessary, but at certain times or those people, those teachers, those who are uh, have done uh, the special education, they can uh, they can say what attention a span short attention span is all uh, all about, and they try hard but cannot keep up with the, their their classmates. So these are some of the characteristics of the the learners. They lack self esteem. Uh, you can identify or you can the characteristics of them. They low on achievement test. Again, I don't, uh, uh, I I don't go in or I don't. I mean, uh, agree to this. Uh, they are low on achievement test, but these are some of the characteristics given in the books or in the literature because low achievement can be due to all that. We reading and writing are one of the characteristics. They need support and punishment to maintain interest. So these are some of the characteristics of slow learners. And what are the some of the challenges faced by slow learners in our education system? These are educational challenges, social challenges, and personal challenges. I'll not get into the details of it because all of you, you know, if there is a slow learners classroom, students, those who are uh, little advance in learning or they achieve more, they don't talk to the students who are slower in, in learning. All of you, you know these, these are the challenges faced by the slow learners. They have personal problems also. Now, how do you engage these slow learners in depending upon uh, the kind of the subject uh, you're talking about, not the other discipline you're talking about, the subject matter, or the level at which there can be, if not audible, no voice. Now you will listen to it. Are uh, you can hear it now? So engagement of slow learners in the classroom, how do you do it? How do you engage them? You can break down tasks into smaller and manageable steps. Now you come, you think of it. The students, there are 40 students. And suppose there is only one uh, slow learner in your class. How do you manage that? There are, if there are five uh, slow learners in your class, still it is little manageable, right? So first you have to identify how many and then you have to do the whole thing. So you have to break break down the task into smaller manageable steps, provide clear, concise instructions. Uh, you can offer various choices for student autonomy. You can utilize technology if the slowness they slow learners can can be technology wise good. So you can utilize technology. You can celebrate success and provide positive reinforcement to such students, and then how do you engage? And that's how you engage the students in the classroom. Then, how are some of the tips you can uh, help uh, to a slow learner? You can encourage peer tutoring and be supportive. You can set realistic expectations, and you can have smaller targets, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, coming to the average learners. Now, see, this is the, I don't know how to, to put this, this into. If in a class of 40, you have, let's say, five slow learners, 20 average learners, and the rest of them, they are advanced learners, how you are going to identify them? how you are going to plan your teaching strategy and how you are going to cope up with your syllabus and so on. Right? 
this is really a challenge for the teachers and that's i don't know uh, both informal system as well as in the distance education system so uh, average learners and i feel all of us are average learners some of you can be advanced learner but i put myself as an average learner so average learner what can be the some of the effective teaching strategies for me it should be for all you can have culturally responsive teaching in a classroom in a formal system if if i talk about tamil nadu classes let's say all children students will be tamilians so they know the culture maybe some of the students they are from the hindi speaking so that becomes different so when you are giving examples your or your teaching it will it will again depend upon that whether how teaching strategy you can plan if there are culturally responsive uh, teaching the students your learning will be much more effective you can uh, in very based instruction you can have cooperative learning you can have differentiated learning so all these points you can have for your effective teaching for average for me it is for everyone actually your advanced learners what so this is again a challenge for teachers i don't know about this it all depends upon your writing of the material how do you write material because in distance education you don't know your learners they can be slow learners they can be average learners they can be advanced learners so how you are going to write down your learning material uh, for the such diverse learners for formal system in a classroom it's still acceptable teacher can see in one or two classes or one first week or a second week and then can he or she can plan accordingly but in in distance education how do you do it it is really a challenge so what you can do for strategies for advanced learners you can have project work you can have you can formal system you can have and send them to the library you can ask them to use the library more frequently you can engage them in peer teaching you can have, uh, you can give them academic recognition in your board of studies or in your annual feedbacks uh you can give them different types of assignments so even in formal system even in your distance education this point i will i will i will highlight that you can write assignments on more challenging topics give the assignment give the project work give them some um uh, research work which is much more challenging for them. so there can be different strategies for the advanced learners but last two three four slides for me on this session is that majority of the learners for me as i think i think about it that majority of the learners they can be they are classified as normal learners. few learners yes in your classroom and at distance they can be can be differentiated but majority of in a classroom they are normal learners and majority of these learners they have average abilities okay so last point which i want to talk about is how do you deal with it and whole literature everyone in education system we are talking about now differentiated learning design how you will do it it is a challenge it is very very important but 
what a learning design or an instructional design, all of you who know about it. In B.Ed., when we were doing, at least when I was doing B.Ed., and those who are from the education background in this group, they know we make a lesson plan. So these days, we don't talk about that we lesson plan. It's called a learning design. A design where the students can learn. Okay? So that's what it is when you go to a classroom. You prepare yourself for such diverse learners. And you have to, this is a challenge again for the teacher that how do you make your design so that you cater to all these diverse learning groups? You make your learning material so that you have, you cater to all these things. So you will, you will ask me a question. Maybe some of you can ask me a question that if there are 40 students in the classroom, how will it, there be a 40 learning designs? Or there will be 10 learning designs or there will be five, learn, five learning designs or there will be just one learning design. Right? So as a, as a teacher, you can, you can always say that for 40 students, I cannot make five learning designs or lesson plans if you understand that language, but start using this language learning designs. Okay? So you, you will say that I cannot have five learning designs. I will have only one design when I go to my classroom. But as a teacher, your responsibility is, it's not that you are catering to only the, your advanced learners or to your average learners. You have to see. Hello, yes. Yes, uh, maybe. Just uh, yes, ma'am. I want to say something uh, regarding sure. the learning design. Definitely, as a teacher, I might have a, a three or four design because there are type different type of student in my class. Uh, okay. Some one of the uh, very slow learner. So that okay. design should be applied for them. Another design, who, those who are very fast learner, another design applied to them. So that's why uh, definitely a teacher should have three or four uh, type of design. That is uh, totally my okay. opinion. Okay. So if I ask you that when next time you go to three, four learning design, I hope you will be able to make it. Will you? You will have that much time? Or the rest of the teachers, they disagree to this statement? Come on. Come on. And ma'am, it is difficult to make two, uh, two, three or four types of design because we have a very limited time frame. And we have to cater to different students, so it's difficult. Right. Only one. Okay. I mean, we have to cover everything. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So uh, basically, the point which she raised was that she nibedita that she can she they should be three four learning designs for different to cater to different. But there are some uh, issues problems uh, which the teachers will say that um, eight hours they are in the in, in a day they are in the college or in the university they have to prepare for the next classes then if they plan for the learning designs it takes time it all depends upon one's capability some of you you said no this has to be one learning design now if it has to be one learning design then how do you do it your activities your learning outcomes, your teaching methodology, your assessment has to cater to the various types. So you should have learning activities which students who are at lower level, they can also do it. You should have design your activities for students who are much more at a higher level. Those who are, you categorize it as an advanced learner. Okay? So when you make a learning design, 
your learning design should cater to all these points. That's what it is called a differentiated learning design that you have to have catered to all the diverse group. Strategies of managing classroom diversity. There are several uh, strategies. Maybe I'll skip to these points. It is talking about the classroom. You can give projects. You can uh, have this cooperative or collaborative learning. And we have talked about the cultural awareness part of it. But as a teacher, understanding students' learning style is very important. So you will say, or if I tell you that next time you visit your tomorrow morning when you are taking your class, or teachers from the distance education system, when they are writing down their material, they should see whether the students are auditory, visual, kinesthetic, or they are slow learners, or they are 21st century learners, or they are advanced learners, and so on and so forth. So you will, you but you, but in a formal system, as well as in the open ed education system, we firstly, we need to understand ourselves. And that's why we are doing this session that you know that the learners are different. Their capabilities are different. Their learning styles are different. So once you are aware of it, you will be able to plan your classroom teaching, your teaching strategy, your learning material, your assessments differently. Thank you and good night and my apologies for the technology uh, failure in between. Now we can have questions, answers, another, maybe it is three to four, five minutes. We can have that. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. It was a very good, wonderful presentation. Dr. Pad, you are Dr. Padmanabhan. You are from Tamil Nadu. Okay. You no, just I'm think. Not, I'm not from Tamil Nadu. I'm Karnataka. Oh, Karnataka. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah only... uh, okay. Go ahead. It's a, it's a very good presentation. So, a thought provoking one and insightful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, just three or four of you were talking. I want to have a few questions from some other because we are 44 in this group right now. Very good lecture, ma'am. I appreciate your knowledge. Very good lecture, ma'am. Yeah, I am from Bihar, Nalanda University. Good. So yeah. if now I'm I will... I'm professor in Department of Education, ma'am. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm Hindi mein bolungi. Hindi mein, I'm sure mm -hmm. my colleagues from West Bengal, they will understand Hindi. Um, you can also speak in Bengali. I'm mm -hmm. uh, Hindi. 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 Uh, a feedback to me and to also to the organizers also. Okay, ma'am. What is it? My name is Nalanda Open University. So, we take the classes, ma'am. They take online. And you said that you are a slow learner and an average student and a gifted child. We teach the same thing in our education and our children's education. We teach the same thing in our children's education. We teach the same thing in our children's education. इन इसी कंटेंट को पढ़ाते हैं तो आपके इस, आपके इस लेक्चर से मैम मैंने अपने नॉलेज को ब्रश अप किया जी और क्योंकि हमारे ऑनलाइन बच्चे होते हैं आफ्टर कोरोना ऑफलाइन बच्चे नहीं हैं सारे हमारे टीचर हैं और आप जानती हैं कि ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी में जो भी स्टूडेंट होते हैं वो जनरली कहीं ना कहीं अच्छे वेल प्लेस्ड होते हैं उनके लिए आना बहुत पॉसिबल नहीं रहता ऑनलाइन होने की वजह से वो क्लास तो कर लेते हैं पर उनमें ये इस तरह 
तरह की कमी है ना कि वो स्लो लर्नर है इस तरह का प्रॉब्लम ये ओपन यूनिवर्सिटीज के बच्चों में नहीं होती है क्योंकि हमारे बच्चे जो होते हैं वो हमारी तरह कहीं असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर होते हैं कहीं एसोसिएट भी होते हैं और बहुत सारे तो मतलब बहुत ही ऊंचे ऊंचे पोस्ट पे होते जो जुड़े होते हैं तो उनके क्वेश्चन बहुत अच्छे आते हैं तो जब मैं रेगुलर मोड में पढ़ाती थी तो इस तरह के प्रॉब्लम आते थे जो आपने बताया ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी में इस तरह के प्रॉब्लम नहीं है मैम पर जब हमारा बी के बच्चे आते हैं मैं आपको बताती हूँ जो आपके कोर्स में होंगे वो इन सर्विस टीचर्स या इन सर्विस लोग होंगे पर अगर आप टीचर जो होते हैं मैम तो वो काफी कैपेबल होते हैं वो चीजों को वो इन बातों को सीख करके अपनी क्लास में इम्प्लीमेंट करते हैं राइट पर, को, जी। पर अगर मैं बात करूं वो जनरल जो स्टूडेंट्स हमारे पास आते हैं बीए इकोनॉमिक्स में बीए ज्योग्राफी में बीए इंग्लिश में बीए हिंदी में जो वो स्टूडेंट्स आते हैं ना वो कई वाले जिनको एडमिशन फॉर्मल सिस्टम में नहीं मिलता वो आते हैं हमारे पास तो हमको उनको भी केटर करना है आपके पास जो स्टूडेंट आते हैं वो मेच्योर जो हमने कहा कि मेच्योर लर्नर्स होते हो सकते हैं मेच्योर लर्नर्स उस लेवल के हमारे अगर स्टूडेंट्स आते हैं कई कोर्सेज में कई प्रोग्राम्स में हमारे पास वो अलग तरीके के होते हैं तो उनके लिए हमको अलग करना पड़ेगा आपकी बात बिल्कुल सही है कि आपके पास जो आ रहे हैं वो मेच्योर लर्नर्स है उनका जी उसमें मैम प्रॉब्लम क्या है ना कि हमारे जो हमारे नालंदा ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी में फीमेल स्टूडेंट को हमने हर एक कोर्स में 25 परसेंट डिस्काउंट दे रखा है तो फीमेल स्टूडेंट काफी आते हैं तो उनके साथ वो मतलब स्लो लर्नर की जगह उनके साथ ये प्रॉब्लम होता है कि वो कभी का, काफी अच्छी स्टूडेंट रही थी पर उन्होंने जब बीच में अपने लर्निंग को छोड़ दिया अपना मतलब बीच में पढ़ाई को छोड़ दिया था उसकी वजह से अभी प्रेजेंट डेट में उनके जो उनके साथ जो मेंटल प्रॉब्लम आ रहा होता है तो आपके इस कंटेंट को सीख के सुनने के बाद मतलब वो हम लोग करते हैं वो तो जिसमें मोड वाले वो करना होता है कि अपने स्टूडेंट को काफी उनको बुस्टअप करना पड़ता है और तब उनका परफॉर्मेंस बहुत बढ़िया निकल कर आता है तो ये सा, okay. सारी बातें हमारे साथ ज्यादा है मैम ओके एनी वन एल्स वन और टू क्वेश्चन Uh, yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, just ah, uh, I mean, ah, uh, in the CAS uh, system, we have some. There is a provision for remedial classes, ah, uh, for which we are also given awarded additional points. So I was, I'm not from education background. I'm from history background. So I was just ah uh, wondering what the UGC expects us ah uh, during the remedial classes. Is it is it for slow learners? And if we segregate a bunch of students as slow learners for the remedial classes. uh doesn't it uh, kind of uh, chip away on their self confidence uh, so so actually remedial classes are not only for slow learners remedial classes are at times maybe a student has it can be i'm not saying it is not at times students for some reason or the other has not been able to attend classes or attend school or attend um the 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 higher education system or not able to come to the to the system then for them you can have those remedial teaching but majority of the time remedial teaching is there yes, when the students they need extra input on their learning it is again the role of the teacher because you said if you identify them you identify the way you identify them and what all you have to give them uh, you have to it's not only the subject it is the motivation also along with the subject you have to motivate those students when they come to the remedial classes and remedial classes is not only let's say i am weak in english but i am very good in mathematics so i need a remedial class in english only in english so mm. that's that's what see see there are very per, many permutation combinations one has to see i am very bad in chemistry but i am very good in mathematics so what i do is i need a remedial class in chemistry okay right yes so that, that is what is and then definitely uh, the when we say the 21st century teachers 21st century teachers they have this very important role to play to motivate the students uh, not only the slow learners they have to motivate students those who are uh, achievers or those who are in advanced learning so they have to do that okay ma'am i got it now thank you <clears throat> okay uh, 44 se 36 reh gaye participant dr sudarshan 
So at uh, times to close, it means? Yes, ma'am. Uh, now uh, we close after giving formal vote of thanks, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it's a matter of great privilege for the IIC, Netaji Shubhash Open University and Uttarakhand Open University to conduct this one week national level online faculty development program on strategies for developing outcome based curriculum and utilizing digital tools in education. On behalf of the organizing committee for both the university, Uttarakhand Open University and Netaji Shubhash Open University, I extend my thanks to our resource person, Professor Madhu Parhar, Professor Indra Gandhi National Open University, for her guidance and valuable speech. We observe Peter of Silence during her lecture. Really, it's a great pleasure for us. Thank you so much, ma'am. I express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Onivan Ghosh, Chairperson, IIC, Head of the Department of Commerce and Management, Director, SPS, SPS, and SICA, to be a strong pillar for the community. Professor Ghosh is known for his figure and hard work in this community and the university as well. I extend my sincere gratitude to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Om Prakash Nehi, Uttarakhand Open University for his guidance. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Indrojit Lahiri, for his continuous guidance and encouragement, which has helped us to work with a lot of confidence. We are also grateful to the whole team of both the university, Uttarakhand Open University and IIC Netaji Shubhar Open University for their special support to organize this activity. Last but not the least, my heartfelt thanks to all the participants for to be present here to grace the occasion. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all of you. And good night. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so good much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, close court chita hale and court chita hale session. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Good night.